My sister was out at a protest. The riot police started shooting tear gas and she was in a stage where she didn't want to run anymore. There are two kinds of heroes. There are heroes who preach and there are heroes who do. They're the people who don't ask you to go and stand in the front lines. They do it themselves. For centuries, a lot of people thought that no matter what I do, this is not going to change. Nothing's going to change in this country. You know, I believe that at some point, our children and grandchildren are going to speak about our generation and say those people fought for our rights. This is our hope. We will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. So I'm here today to talk to you about the situation in Bahrain. Now usually when I talk about Bahrain, or even mention the word Bahrain, people usually haven't heard of it or they've heard of it for different reasons. Basically because Michael Jackson lived there for a while. Um, or maybe because the Formula One race takes place there every year. Now the situation has changed to some extent because people have heard of the suppression of the protests along with the rest of the Arab Spring that took place in 2010, 2011, and it's still, of course, ongoing in many places. Now, what happened is, all of these countries, you know, usually when we talk about the Arab Spring, we talk about how one of them caused the other. Now, I think that the Arab Spring revolutions inspired each other. Because all of these countries, whether we're talking about Tunisia or Egypt or Bahrain or Yemen or Syria or otherwise, we're looking at countries who all had very similar purposes to take to the streets and demand change. Things like systematic torture, arbitrary arrests, complete economic and political control by usually one family in the country. And Bahrain was no different. It wasn't that the Bahrainis, you know, before 2011 didn't have a reason to go out. They just didn't believe that even if they took to the streets, they could create change. And then when Tunisia and Egypt happened, they said, well, wait a minute, if they can do it in Egypt and Tunisia, and it was that fast, you know, Ben Ali left very quickly, Mubarak stepped down very quickly, then maybe we can do the same in Bahrain. Now, the title of my talk is Bahrain's Inconvenient Revolution. Now, why is it inconvenient? Because Bahrain is not similar in its geopolitical importance to the other countries of the Arab Spring. And that's for many different reasons, which I'll get to a little bit later. But to tell you a little bit about what happened in Bahrain. So people took to the streets in February 2011. You should remember the date because it started on Valentine's Day. And it was one demand, reform. The government had made promises in 2002, or the king rather had made promises in 2002, and people wanted to see those promises implemented. And of course, the government of Bahrain responded just like all the other governments, with a crackdown, arrests, beatings, killings. And that's when people said, well, if the government is willing to kill us for demanding something that they've already promised, then that's a government that needs to go. And that's when the demand changed from reforms to the monarchy needs to step down. People want to choose and elect their own government. Now, on the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, that's not really a demand that people would expect you to make. Because when people took to the streets in Bahrain, they weren't fighting one government. They weren't fighting one oppressive monarchy. They were fighting six oppressive monarchies. Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and Oman, and Qatar, and all of these different countries of the UAE as well as the Bahraini monarchy. Now, how many of you here have Facebook? Raise your hands. Twitter? Come on, guys. Twitter is so much more fun. <laughs> anyway, um, imagine there were students your age in university in Bahrain who would get picked up from their homes and arrested during house raids in the middle of the night. 
people who lost their jobs or got expelled from school because they clicked like on a picture on Facebook. How many times a day do you click on the like button when you enter your Facebook page? Now imagine that every single one of those like clicks that you do a day can result in you losing your education, losing your freedom. And it's the same thing with Twitter. 140 characters can mean that you go to prison. And the situation has carried on from 2011. Now, of course, after the protest started and the situation got to the extent where the government could no longer deal with the protest movement because you had more than 50% of the population of citizens in Bahrain taking to the streets. More than 50%. Largest per capita protest in the Arab Spring. So what happened next? The Saudis and the UAE troops rolled in over the bridge to help the Bahraini government put down a popular uprising. Now we saw an, a foreign intervention in another country, in Libya, where NATO helped the rebels against Gaddafi. In Bahrain it was quite the opposite. The intervention was not for the protesters. It was against the protesters. And the, the situation has continued since then. The crackdown, the midnight house raids, the arbitrary arrests, the systematic physical, uh, psychological, and sexual torture. You get picked up by the police, you better bet you're going to get beaten or tortured. Now, what really disturbs me, the thing that I cannot fathom the most, are the democratic countries who say that their foreign policy is based, the cornerstone of their foreign policy, is based on democracy and human rights, then turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to human rights violations in a place like Bahrain because it's a close ally and friend. Yes, I'm speaking about the United States of America and the United Kingdom. We're looking at a situation where just a few weeks ago, we saw the Secretary of State John Kerry come out and make a statement about Ukraine. Now, what did he say? He said, in the 21st century, you cannot, under f false pretexts, invade another country. Now, isn't that what Saudi Arabia and the UAE did in 2011? But what did the Secretary of State back then say about Bahrain? Hillary Clinton at the time, of course. She said, Bahrain has the sovereign right to invite foreign troops into the country. How is that for double standards? The United States and the United Kingdom continue to sell arms and military weapons to the Bahraini government because they're an ally. And that's the sad truth, is that even at a time when people preach human rights as being the most important thing, the blood of a Bahraini citizen is not as valuable as a barrel of oil coming from Saudi Arabia. Because your value as a human being is only as much as the passport or the nationality that you carry. And the interests that you can serve for certain countries. And when you look at the civil rights movement in Bahrain, it should remind you of the civil rights movement here in the United States. People who took to the streets day in and day out, despite the risks, fighting for something that they knew was theirs. The very reason that President Obama sits in the White House today. And yet, that very same president stands with the Bahraini government today against a civil rights movement that started in the 1920s and continues to happen today. Now, of course, a lot of you may ask, well, you know, I'm sitting thousands of miles away from that country. Why should it bother me? Why should I do anything about it? There's a lot of reasons, but I'll give you two. I grew up in Denmark. I never envisioned in my life that I will be put in a situation like I am today, where my father is in prison serving a life sentence for being a human rights defender, where my uncle is serving five years for being a political activist, where my sister was just released after serving a one-year prison sentence because she protests, where I have friends, colleagues, and family members in and out of prison because they chose to practice their universal right to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. I never envisioned that that would happen. And me on this stage today could be any one of you. Any one of you. Because I grew up in the exact same circumstances as you guys. 
And the other reason is, when you see an injustice anywhere in the world, and you choose to do nothing about it, you are not only doing an injustice to the victim of that violation, you are doing an injustice to yourself. Because when you see someone else being made into a victim, when you see a human rights violation, when you see crimes happening, and I know a lot of us have been desensitized because of the videos that come out of Syria, for example. Today we're able to look at so many videos of beheadings and killings and so on and you know, go back to sleep. And that's very unfortunate because those are human beings that we're watching. But when we choose to do that and turn you know, a blind eye to what's happening, we're also losing part of our own humanity. And so, you know, someone once said, the secret to life is happiness. And the secret to happiness is courage. Thank you very much.